Aloha, Aaron Tui here, and you're watching Huakanu Plants, Fruits, and Vegetables. Thank you for joining me. I haven't made a video in a long time, and i um, just been caught up in other things with schooling and other plant projects. But I wanted to share a certain presentation, just make a video on um, something I've been learning this past semester. So I'm taking entomology this semester at the University of Hawaii I'm majoring in tropical plants and soil sciences and uh, everything that I learn in this field I always like to share uh, same with other videos that I'm making on hydroponics and and plantings and um, <coughs> uh, the other reason why I wanted to share this video is I'm using uh, photos in my presentation uh, that from people photographers that I know personally and I wanted to show them how I'm using those photos in my presentation. Um, so just bear with me with this presentation on uh, Nymphalidae, butterflies. Um, I did this pre presentation a couple of days ago and uh, I'm, uh, my mind is somewhere else right now. It's on actually my finals and my paper. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, if you like it, go ahead and share it. It'll be exciting for others to learn uh, some of these things. We're going to be talking about native species and uh, just this family of butterflies in general. Um, just to give you a heads up, the requirements for this presentation was to <coughs> just present uh, general information on this family of butterflies and also to narrow down all that information, scientific data, findings and things to a five minute five minute presentation so there's going to be um, just a few slides and uh, mostly pictures and I'm going to be talking a lot um, and for five minutes you may think that okay that's you know easy presentation super quick and you don't have to worry about anything but actually it was uh, harder than you think to pick out the information that is important that needed to be shared putting it into uh, this short presentation. So what I wanted to do with this video is just elaborate on some of the things that I covered so that the audience can have um, a better understanding of what I talk about. Also, um, I don't like to share a lot of text because it kind of takes away... I mean, no, when you're watching a presentation, you never really read all the text because the person is talking. Um, <coughs> so I, there's more pictures than anything and I hope you enjoy it. Again, my name is Aaron Tui and we're going to get started. So I'm presenting on Nymphalidae butterflies, which is also known as the brush-footed butterflies. So Nymphalidae butterflies are the largest butterfly families found in the order Lepidoptera. They're comprised of more than 6,000 described species. So species that have been recorded, studied, and publications were made of those discoveries. And this family can be found in all regions of the world. There's 12 subfamilies and these butterflies, like the rest, exhibit a complete life cycle, meaning they have, uh, they come from an egg, they transition to a larval stage, then to a pupal stage, and then the adult. Um, this family of butterflies is known to have the most colorful butterflies. And some of those butterflies are commonly known are the monarch butterflies, admirals, skippers, and the morpho blues. Now there are two native butterflies and hundreds of native moths in the Lepidopteran order found here in Hawaii. However, there's only one native butterfly within this family, and that is the Kamehameha butterfly, also known as the Vanessa Tamehameha. <coughs> so this is the butterfly, uh, Kamehameha butterfly right here. It's found in native only to Hawaii. It looks a lot similar to the Admiral butterflies and um, it's sitting uh, perched up on a strawberry guava leaf right here and it's taken by a photographer who I know 
and volunteer with with the Oahu Army Natural Resource Program and this is in an area that's protected and um, what we do is we go in and we help to manage the native plants and species that's found in these areas and also try to eradicate some invasive species um, and <coughs> so this uh, on our hike uh, we found this chamomile butterfly just chilling on a tree and then flew over to this guava uh, leaf right here so nice pictures thank you Roy for those so who discovered or who described the Nymphalidae family or butterflies? I want to go back to the 1700s and bring up a very important person in the natural sciences community and that is Maria Sibylla Merian. And she was a famous artist, illustrator of the natural world. Animals, plants, insects, specifically butterflies, and moths through all her work and she can be noted as a heroine in this in this um, field of study in the 1700s for two reasons one during this time it was thought that insects bacteria were spontaneously generated out of the earth and the other thing is that butterflies and caterpillars were thought to be two distinct and individual insects separate from each other. So through Maria's work um, and her study, observations, her travels, she was able to disprove these, these two understandings or theories. So with her travels to South America at her older age, um, she was able to study the native species there in Suriname. She was able to um, identify and learn the native names of the species, the plants, and through all of her work and observations compiled, she was able to really solidify the understanding that butterflies and caterpillars were in fact the same and had a what we know today as a complete life cycle. Without her work, we wouldn't have that understanding of holometabolism today. So if you look at some of her artwork here, she actually um, displays the complete life cycle. Here on the right, um, if we start with the larvae, the caterpillar, right underneath we see a little dot on that leaf. That's the egg. To the left of it, I think this is the first instar um, of the caterpillar in the larvae phase. And there's three phases that the caterpillars go through. And this red caterpillar is probably that last phase before the pupa stage. Here on the right we see a chrysalis type structure, which is the pupa, followed by the adult up here on the top. We have the underside of the wing and the top side of the wing here and this is most likely a morpho blue and this is very important because a lot of her work her artwork is used today to help identify these insects in the wild or plants and uh, animals the other thing is the artwork produced during this time were more um, flat and not dimensional at all um, say like for this butterfly picture here um, but with her artwork it's more two to three dimensional As you see from this previous work um, the leaves are curled up and it looks like um, that you're actually looking as if the butterflies or moths or animals were, were right there <coughs> so that's what's uh, very key to her work is she would draw the natural habitat of these insects um, as they were alive. And a lot of the work produced this time were of insects that were dead. That's another factor of her work. So moving on, um, if you get a chance please do so look up uh, more of Maria's work because it's um, there's a lot, this can be a whole new presentation that I can make. 
So let's look at the phylogeny, the generation um, <coughs> of the Nymphalidae family butterflies. So what we're looking at here is 12 subfamilies here. And on the right here, we're looking at plants that are related to these uh, subfamilies. And we have an understanding that butterflies have preferred plants that they eat, lay their eggs on. Um, so what does this mean? To get an understanding of when these butterflies existed, we have to go back and look at fos fossil records. With the Nymphalidae family butterflies, there are not too many fossil records available. So through some of the studies that uh, I've been researching and going through, <coughs> instead of using the fossil records of the insects themselves, they use the fossil records of the plants that they're associated with to come up with an estimated existence um, year in the history of time. And let's look at two subfamilies here, Danianae, which is the second one here, and Satyrinae. So Danianae, uh, their host plant is milkweeds. This is the subfamily for monarch butterflies. <coughs> In Hawaii, the monarch butterflies like to lay their eggs and feed on crown flowers, which is in this um, family of plants here. And Satyrinae like to um, also live and eat off of grasses in the Poesi family. So these two factors are very important because, let's see, the Nyanae and their plants were found 83 million years ago. Satyrinae and their host plant was found 65 million years ago. <coughs> this is important because 65 million years ago was documented in um, just to describe the KT boundary and what that is is a just a cataclysmic event that happened um, where many insects and plants were decimated and uh, phylogenies or species died off during this event so 83 million years ago the monarch butterflies existed and we see here up on the top left in this image and the orange um, genealogical track there there's not that much species compared to this bottom one here all in yellow which is Satyrinae and um, if we look at Satyrinae they existed during or after the KT boundary event. And the monarch butterflies, the Nyanae, existed before that. So with that understanding alone, we can see that the monarch butterflies could have lost, although they were older, had a lot of more time to um, diversify their species to different climates or areas. <coughs> we can tell that after the KT boundary event, a lot of those species may have been lost. But the subfamily Satyrinae, existing during or after that event, had the opportunity to diversify on a larger scale. The other thing is that because Satyrinae's host plant is grasses, we all know that grass can be found everywhere in the world in abundance. With those two things, um, an abundant of their host plant and existing after the KT boundary, we have an understanding why the Satyrinae have such a large subfamily. Their subfamily was so large that um, they were actually grouped into their own family called Satyridae. Um, but their <coughs> relation to Nymphalidae was greater and so they put them back into the proper taxonomic family. So to help understand or ID the butterflies within this family, we had to research on what was the physical characteristics that we can see and observe with our own eyes that can ID butterflies specifically only in this family, Nymphalidae. Now, remember, Nymphalidae is the largest butterfly group um, family 
and there's over 6,000 species and all those species are very diverse in size and color and shape and to narrow down <coughs> this large family to um, ID them to be um, what did you call it individuals in this own family relation I narrowed it down to two physical um, or morphological uh, forms. So if you read it already, the first and main one that guarantee, hands down, <coughs> is having short front legs. Now insects have six legs, and these four legs, F-O-R-E, are shortened, they're non-functional, and typically they have hair all over it. Um, some don't have that much but still have more hair than their other legs and it's usually always tucked away never in use so if you ever see a butterfly that exhibiting only four legs guarantee it's a nymphalidae the other one is um, more so it's, it's a lot more subtle uh, you, most likely you'll probably need an electron microscope a very powerful microscope to see this <coughs> but there's three noticeable ridges on the ventral side, so it's on the underside of their antennas, and all the nymphalidae butterflies will have this. Um, so those are the only two things that um, can guarantee the identification of a butterfly in this family. So just to finish up, I just wanted to share something that um, I probably learned when I was younger, kind of forgot, <coughs> but that's the migration of the monarch butterfly. So, of course, monarchs are in the Nymphalidae family, and I wanted to share just this aspect of one species <coughs> or genre of butterflies within this family. Um, so I had no idea that butterflies migrate. Um, my thinking was that insects um, go through a diapause stage where they don't um, they kind of go dormant I guess um, during winter or, or harsh climatic um, seasons or changes but not monarch butterflies they they migrate uh, when they're adults and they're flying <coughs> during the winter within one generation monarch butterflies in the northern states and Canada make their migra migratory uh, journey down to Mexico and it's not just anywhere in Mexico it's a specific place that's down here found to be occupied by the native Mazahua people um, after winter during spring and back to summer it takes them three to four generations to make it all the way back up to the northern states so very interesting and very cool and um, they travel in the millions the millions so if you ever seen monarch butterflies traveling like this if you're in um, say the Midwest <coughs> and you see this um, it's most likely they're it's time for them to migrate and they're heading down to Mexico and that specific area where I'm talking about is here shown here in these lush green um, forest of pine trees, conifers you see this brown orange patch it's not disease, it's actually the monarch butterflies by the millions they would roost here during the winter create their next generation to fly back up <coughs> and they're what they're doing is they're roosting on these trees that absorb the heat during the day from the sun and those trees would keep them warm uh, uh, throughout the night and they will do this year upon year um, so much so that the government had set apart uh, a refuge just an area specifically for the butterflies uh, there's more about this um, conservation efforts there's um, the natives rights as well to to log and um, that whole this ordeal it's, it's another thing that you can learn about um, so what has that to do with human relationships 
culturally, as you can see here, the monarch butterflies represent um, their ancestors that has passed. So the arrival of the monarch butterflies is actually the signifies the start of the Day of the Dead festival. Um, and here you can see displayed in these pictures are the costumes inspired by monarch butterflies and the Day of the Dead. So <coughs> it's a it's a big festival and a th and a cultural aspect for the Mazahua people. Of course, the Day of the Dead festival is practiced and um, carried out by many of the Latino communi communities from Mexico all the way down through Argentina, whole South America. So that's my presentation and <laughs> you can just imagine the five minute presentation that I would have to do with um, in my class. Withholding some of that information was pretty hard um, so it's been 20 minutes and these are my references for this slideshow. If you have any more questions, go ahead and leave a comment down below and share this video if you enjoyed it. And um, thank you very much for all, you, all of you who are interested in conservation and um, having a hand into saving the Kamamea butterfly. I know the university has a program called the Pulehulehu program. I think the website is pulehulehu.org. You get involved in um, monitoring the Kamehameha butterfly populations here in Hawaii. And uh, without further ado, thank you again and aloha.